Okay, it's uh, day three at the NAM conference and we're here with Karen Masters of LOFAR UK. Hello Karen, and could you explain what LOFAR is? Certainly, uh, LOFAR stands for the Low Frequency Array. It's a radio telescope working at the lowest frequencies uh, accessible from the surface of the Earth. Um, it's an array telescope and what that means is that the antennas are, are spread out right across Europe actually um, uh, in different stations. Um, the core of LOFAR is in the Netherlands and, and the Dutch uh, group Astron run the LOFAR project, um, but there are also international stations, there's five of them in Germany, one in France, one in Sweden, and we have one in the UK. Okay, and unlike traditional radio telescopes, this is non steerable You're kind of almost going back to first principles with radio astronomy, aren't you? That's right, yeah. The antennas themselves, um, each station is made up of 96 antennas, um, actually 96 times two, because we have uh, different types of antennas for the two bands which span the FM radio band, um, are either side of it. Um, and the antennas themselves are extremely simple, just bits of wire. And in fact, um, the, the UK station uh, in Hampshire was constructed by volunteers from universities along the south coast, including uh, the University of Portsmouth, where I work. Um, a whole bunch of us went to the field and, and put the antennas up ourselves because they're really simple. Um, but what, you know, this is going back to the old technology that we used to use in the 60s, or well not me, but people used to use in the 60s t to do radio astronomy. But the reason that, that it's, you know, it, we've gone back to this is because of uh, the internet, because of high-speed internet and because of supercomputers. We can combine the signal from these many thousands of arrays across Europe and synthesize a telescope the size of Europe. So how do you point it? It's some kind of time delay array system, or how do you actually point it at an object in the sky? That's right. There's absolutely no moving points, uh, m moving parts. All the pointing is done in software. And uh, so what, what, what happens is, if you imagine, if you're looking at a source that was directly overhead, um, the signal from that source would hit every antenna in your station at the same time. But if you were looking at a source sort of down on, on, on the horizon, the signal would hit the antennas on that side of the uh, station just a little bit before the ones on the other side. And so by introducing electronic time delays, you can choose which part of the sky to point at. And what's really cool is you can use the same data to point at different places at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I've, I've been seeing about that. You can be observing multiple objects in, in parallel as well. It seems like an amazing new advance in technology, really. Yeah, it means that it, uh, it's really cool. So the, 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 the press release I imagine you're referring to is yes. uh, looking at pulsars with, with LOFAR, and they looked at five pulsars at the same time. Um, and it, it, it's quite important for certain types of, types of astronomy to be able to do that. Um, the other fun thing is you don't have to decide in advance where you're pointing. So if you discover that you've got data that covers a period of time when something interesting happened in the sky, if you put in the right time delays, you can, can make an observation of that part of the sky. And in terms of things like target of opportunity events, if something interesting happened in the sky that you wanted to get the radio observations on, how quickly can LOFAR kind of be tasked to do that? Well, pointing is basically immediate, right, because it's software. I mean, it's just going to be uh, in terms of coordinating the array r right across Europe and, and how much of it you want to include. Um, we do... Uh, at each station, um, some small fraction of the data is saved, or it's saved for a small time delay. So if you were linked with a satellite or linked with something that was detecting uh, TO target of opportunity stuff, um, you can go back a few minutes, I think. But it's actually an enormous, as you might imagine, with thousands of arrays, it's an enormous data flow. And so we just can't possibly save it all indefinitely. So what happens with the data? And you've got this, like I guess, terabytes worth of data streaming out of this thing all the time. Well, what are you doing with the data? Are you storing it in the cloud, in the cloud computing system? Or are you putting it onto servers? Or how are you, how are you managing it? At the moment, I believe uh, what is stored is stored in the Netherlands. There was some discussion of having um, what the, the stuff that comes from Chibolton stored in the UK. I, I don't actually remember where we've got to with that. Um, the Chibolton station is the equivalent of 50,000 broadband internet users in this tiny village in Hampshire. That's the internet connection we have uh, to the Netherlands. And that's the dominant price of the UK station. The parts and all of that is, is negligible. Amazing, amazing. And you've got this staggering, it's 1,300 kilometres across, I believe, in, in terms of the total array size, something along those lines. That might be the final size final size and you've got this enormous field of view I mean you compare to something like the Hubble Space Telescope in the optical and you've got a very very narrow field of view and the Fox Telescope that I use quite a lot is around about four or five arc minutes in terms of field of view you've got this staggering field of view I mean what kind of observations are you able to do? Um, well all sorts of observations anything that emits at low frequencies can be observed with LOFAR the reason you get that massive field of view well actually if you just took one of those antennas it's sensitive to, to radiation from the entire sky then when you add these time delays in, you narrow the field of view a little bit to, 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 your, uh, to, to, to where you can point and where you can make images. And you get this resolution from a telescope the size of Europe by combining all the signals from right across Europe. So that's exciting. Um, 
uh, LOFAR has such a lot of, of interesting science goals. One of the key science goals um, is to try to detect the time in the universe when the first stars turned on. Um, so before there were any stars in the universe, um, the universe was mostly neutral hydrogen, and that emits a characteristic uh, frequency, which is in, uh, which at high redshift has been redshifted into the, the low frequency bands that LOFAR detects. Um, when, when the first stars turn on, very quickly all that neutral hydrogen becomes ionized and stops emitting that radio frequency. And so with LOFAR, we hope to detect that sort of step in, okay, at these redshifts there is this radio frequency and then suddenly it turns off. And that really actually helps to pin down a lot of information about cosmology. So I, I saw one of your recent press releases, you were observing a quasar 3C196. Um, what kind of science are you getting out of that? Well, that, to be honest, that was sort of a, you know, look what we can do kind of, of press release. That was about... Um, testing the system and, and making sure that we can do the high resolution imaging. Um, ultimately, LOFAR plans to do an all-sky survey, and we can do an all-sky survey because of that big field of view, um, but you also get arc second resolution at these meter wavelengths. It's an amazing resolution. That image impresses me so much. At the resolution of that image, you could tell the time uh, from Big Ben looking at it from Amsterdam. It's astonishing. Are there any plans? I know you said it's mainly based um, in the Netherlands and across Europe. Are there any plans to do a kind of low fire in the southern hemisphere so you would get true all sky coverage? Um, well, there are similar projects um, which are in sort of the construction phase. LOFAR has really led the way of this type of telescope. Um, there's a long wavelength array in the US and a, a MWA, which is a similar telescope in Australia. And then, of course, ultimately, all of these telescopes are sort of pathfinders for the SKA, which is, again, using similar kinds of ideas, sort of low-cost antennas, but connecting them with, with massive computing power. And, and that's going to be much, much larger again. So and SKA, they planned some of the destinations for South Africa and Australia. So, because yeah. obviously, the, the other thing that was interesting with it being based in Europe, the amount of radio noise that you get from ground-based emissions, from terrestrial noise, I mean, how do you, how do you cope with that? Well, it turns out to be not as much of a problem as people initially thought it might be. Um, because those signals are terrestrial in origin, um, and because we have so many different antennas, you can actually sort of filter them out in the software. Um, all of those signals are from close to the horizon, so you imagine you can, you can sort of take that out. I mean, obviously it has some effect. One massive effect is that we're unable to observe anything in the FM radio bands, so we just, there's, just, there's no hope of doing any science in those, those frequencies, so the two bands are either side of it. So we've moved over now, and Karen's showing us an example of one of the low-far uh, radio antenna. Yeah, so what we've got here is basically the business part of one antenna. What we're missing um, is the ground plane, which is this sort of metal mesh which we put on the ground. Um, and that's actually just standard building material from the Netherlands. It's uh, the stuff that they use to reinforce concrete. And so what you do is you lay one of those on the ground, and then you get your, your, your pole, and you feed the cables at the top of it. Um, we stick. This is called the low-noise amplifier. Um, we've attach the cables and stick it on the top and then these bits here are actually the wire, uh, the antennas there's metal wire in here and you, you need four people basically to do this or it's almost like pegging up a tent it's isn't like it like pegging a tent i often describe these as like tents but without uh, without the canvas but yeah you, you 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 peg each of these at the corners of your ground plane and and you're good to go it seems really, it's an amazingly simple kind of design. I mean, you've got this top piece, as you said, and that's about £200, you yeah, said? Yeah, something like £200 on that order. Um, and as I said, the, the hardware is really not the expensive part about LOFAR. Um, obviously, we, we have the cables coming up the, up the pipe, and um, in a single station, those are then they're dug in trenches underground, and they go to the container where some of the processing is done before that signal is then sent on to the Netherlands. Um, and so that cabling and, and laying the cables was a massive job, and that... That was really the expensive part about the installation. The people doing this, as I said before, were volunteers, uh, astronomy researchers who plan to eventually use the data from LOFAR. It's almost like domestic drain pipe. I mean, the thing I'm holding here, the, the support structure for it, really is just a plastic tube. It's, it's it really nothing sophisticated. Is just a plastic tube. I mean, they're a fixed size and, and height, obviously. And then um, the LNA, they have a, a specific orientation you have to get right. But it really wasn't that complicated. So the volunteers at Chabot, and we did, we did all of this, and then we had one guy who would come around and make sure everything was was hunky-dory and the angles were all right and the connections were good and 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 we built a radio telescope which was immense fun it's quite amazing it's almost heath robinson but it's providing some of the most sophisticated radio data pretty much in the world at the moment and i'd like to thank karen uh, for giving us the time thank you